So we're in the series Something Greater. Uh, again, we started a couple weeks ago. We'll actually end it next week. Kind of a short series for us. But we're putting a, a challenge out to you guys in the month of September to do something, to be something greater. And that should resonate because all of us as human beings, we have something inside of us that says, I want to be great. I want to make a difference. I want to leave a mark. It's how God created us. In fact, we looked at a couple weeks ago when G, a couple of Jesus followers came to him and basically said, hey, Jesus, we want to be great, and we know you're great already, so let us be with you. Let us kind of be right by your side and be great with you. He didn't slap him across the head and say, oh, how dare you, you know, be so bold or have such lofty dreams or anything like that. What he did, though, was he said, great, no pun intended, but let's talk about what true greatness is. And then he defined it for him. And essentially, he said what true greatness is, and we've talked about it in the last couple of weeks, is to live a life of service to others. In your profession, and with your specific gifts, with your specific skills, with whatever money you have, it can happen in all kinds of different contexts, right? We don't all have to do this the same, look the same, but ultimately, to fulfill that longing inside of us to be great, we have to serve. We have to actually give away our lives in some form or fashion for the betterment of others. And that's when that all oh, yeah, great, that's great. I'm leaving a mark, I'm making a difference. That's how Jesus defined true greatness. And again, last week we, we talked about the fact that true greatness, according to Jesus, starts in the family. It starts with, with others who are seeking God with you. Who are, and we may not be all on the same page spiritually, and that's totally fine. Some of us are still asking a lot of big questions. Some of us are just maybe, you know, hardly even kicking the tires uh, to where some of you have been walking with Jesus for years and everything in between, and that's awesome. But Jesus said, man, if you're in the family, if you're seeking God together, if you're part of a, a church community, it starts by serving one another. Because family is hard to serve, right? It is. You know, family can be weird, it can be frustrating, it can be tough. It's just, it's fam it's just family. That's just par for the course. And Jesus said, you've got to start there. That's where your heart will really be revealed. That's where your, your intentions about serving will really come to the surface when you choose to serve one another in the family. But... It doesn't stop there. Jesus said, once you get that, once you understand that that's where it all starts, I've got something else for you as well. There are people outside of these church walls. There are people outside of every church building who are hurting, who are hopeless, who are frustrated, who feel lonely, who are going through pain, who aren't necessarily part of the family, but nevertheless, they're close to God's heart. And God says, I want you to go and serve those people as well. This is where it gets tricky, though. This is where I think we go from, um, yeah, I can serve others in the church. It, sometimes it's messy and it's tough and it's frustrating and it even seems beneath me. A lot of things we talked about last week when Jesus washed uh, his disciples' feet, it's kind of like crazy, right? Sometimes it's hard in that sense, but at least as a church, we can rally around people. We can say, hey, there's a need. Let's go to it and we can help. We can do something. There's a lot of us there, and there's resources and let's just take care of it. And this church has done that time and time again with people. It doesn't necessarily solve all the problems, but we've rallied together and helped people out within the family, and that's awesome. When you look outside these walls, though, and you think about the fact, wow, that's, that's the next step. God wants us to go and help people in need outside of the family, so to speak. That's a little intimidating because there's so many needs. Am I right? Just think about it. Just think of all the different things going on and all the different types of people and all the different situations that people find themselves in. And then you think about all the different organizations and ministries that are out there trying to meet those needs. And there's literally thousands of them across this country, maybe millions across the whole world. I don't know. But there's just tons of them, right? There's so much need. And you and I have so little time. And we can look at that and say, that, uh, I don't know. I get it. I can rally together and kind of help just tackle this one thing. But man, you go outside these church walls, that's tough. That's intimidating. That's, that's easy to say, ah, I get it. And I get why Jesus cares about the poor, but I don't have the time. And there's too many needs anyway. I think Jesus faced the same dilemma. One of the things that we read about over and over again in the Bible is that Jesus was close to the poor. He had a heart for people that were hurting. He had a heart for people that were broken. He had a heart for people who the rest of society had said, you know what? We don't need them. We don't want them. You guys kind of move to the fringes of our culture. And Jesus said, no, I love those people. I die. I'm going to die for those people. I, I care for those people. And his heart was so close to the poor and the needy. Yet he faced the same dilemma. Too many needs and too little time. In fact, Jesus, if you ever think you're busy, and what? Let's be real. What's the thing you and I complain to each other about all the time? 
So stinking busy. How was your week? Oh, so crazy, right? And I did it a hundred times this morning. My wife left me for the week. She went to some conference somewhere. Never do that, wives. That is a recipe for disaster. Oh my gosh. I barely survived. I'm serious. Two kids, food, right? I mean, how do you do it? I don't know. Anyway, so we, we got through it somehow. But, um, but that's what I told people all week. Well, how's your week going? It is chaotic. It's hectic. I don't know how my wife does this. This is, a, you know, grew my appreciation for her quite a bit for sure. Um, but we are busy, right? And that's the problem we all share. We're busy. You know who is 10 times busier than you are? When he walked this earth, Jesus. Jesus was a man who, and he wasn't governed by to-do lists or outlook or anything like that. Don't get me wrong when I say this. But he was a person who walked this earth who was constantly being hounded for something. I mean, just every waking moment, people said, Jesus, I need this. Jesus, please do this for, for, uh, this for me. Jesus, I need you to answer this question. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And you want to talk busy? In fact, the Bible says the only time that Jesus could really get alone were very, very early in the morning while everyone else was still sleeping or very late at night after everyone had gone to bed. It's the only time he could do it because he was so busy. People were always after him. People were always needing something, wanting something. He just had no time to himself. And, and, you know, the only two things that we really read about that he did in those few precious moments he got by himself were sleep and pray. That's all, uh, all he could do when he was alone because he had so little time. Jesus was busy. So, so busy. And just like us, he saw all the needs, and he had so little time. He faced the same dilemma, but his heart was for the poor. His heart was for the needy. His heart was for, for the broken. So what did he do? How did he reconcile that? How did he not just serve those around him in the family, those who, were, who believed in him and followed him? What did he do with all those people outside the church walls? Well, there's a story in Mark chapter 5 um, that I think paints a pretty good picture of how Jesus dealt with that dilemma. And I want to just tell you the story this morning. You can look it up if you don't have a Bible with you. You can look it up when you get home, or if you've got a Bible app on your phone, you can pull that up or whatnot. But we're not going to put the words on the screen. We're not going to put, uh, it's not there in your program. I just want you to just hear the gist of the story and try to picture, picture yourself in the story. I mean, just kind of take a step back and say, what would this be like to walk with Jesus, maybe in Jesus' sandals, or maybe in his disciples' sandals, or maybe in part of the crowd? It doesn't really matter. But what would it be like to be there going through this. And just look at, look at this picture of what Jesus is doing. Now again, we established Jesus is busy. He's crazy busy. But I, again, I believe with all my heart, busier than any human being that's ever been on the face of the planet. I uh, recently read that Russell Wilson, go Hawks by the way, um, uh, always keeps like two suits and a tuxedo in his car at all times. Because he's so busy and his schedule is so packed and he's afraid I may not run home and get what I need or this or that. So he just drives around in some vehicle that's like fully equipped for every situation he's going to face. Because the guy's so stinking busy between his endorsements and practice and media and all that kind of stuff, right? Jesus was busier. I guarantee it. So here's Jesus going through his busy life. Everyone wanted a piece of him. All kinds of demands, all kinds of questions. Every waking moment, he's getting hounded, right? And in this particular situation, Mark chapter 5, he had even been given a specific request earlier in the day that he said yes to, which now he's got something, not only is he just going to be hounded and crazy busy throughout the day like he always is with gobs and gobs of people trying to get near him and talk to him, but now he had something that he really, he wanted to go do. He said yes to, he had made a commitment, I'm going to go do this thing. And that commitment was, he, was, he told a synagogue ruler that he would go and heal his daughter. Earlier in the day, this man had come to him and said, Jesus, my daughter is at at home, sick in bed, and she is dying. Will you come and heal her? Will you come and touch her? Will you come and pray for her? Will you do something? And Jesus said, yeah, I will. I will. So they're on this journey now. And just picture, you're going through a crowded urban marketplace type area, and this is first century Palestine, right? Dusty, dirty, but super noisy. Animals are walking around. Gobs and gobs of people, right? And of course, everyone wants a piece of Jesus. Everyone's getting, trying to get to Jesus. Everyone wants to ask him a question, talk to him, and touch him, and, and hear from him, and whatever. And he's walking along with his disciples on this mission, by the way. He's got a four o'clock appointment. It's in Outlook. He's, I got to get there. And he stops. And he looks at his disciples and says, someone touched me. Now, now put yourself in the disciples' shoes specifically for a moment. You're thinking, Jesus is losing it. Of course someone touched him. Dozens of people are touching him all at once. That's how it is every day for us. Everyone's touching Jesus. Everyone wants to be near Jesus. He's so stinking busy. He can't get a break. But Jesus says, someone touched me. And then all of a sudden, this frail, older woman, very sick, 
says, that was me. Jesus knew there, there, even though all these people were touching him, something specific had happened, something very uh, unique to all the rest of the crowd had happened where he knew, wow, someone reached out to me in faith, needing my touch, needing to experience me. Now this woman, if you don't know the story, has been very sick. The Bible tells us she's been sick for 12 years due to bleeding. I don't know, you can f- figure out what that exactly was um, that she was suffering with. But the Bible says she'd been suffering for 12 years for bleeding nonstop. Just wouldn't stop. And she'd given all her money. She'd, or she'd paid all her money to doctors to try to figure out what the problem was. Heal me. Fix me. Give me answers. You know, whatever. I, and she spent everything she had. A lot of us, it's really easy to look at uh, someone who's in a very poor, destitute situation and just say, eh, drug addict. Eh, all you did was just make terrible choices and, you know, whatever. You deserve it or you made, it's your fault. Sometimes that might be true. I'm not saying it's not. But a lot of times it's people who went through something like this woman, right? She's going along in life. All of a sudden she gets this sickness, this disease, something. She's in pain. It won't stop. It's totally taken over her life. She spends everything she has to try to fix it. Nothing. And then she hears about Jesus. And she goes to him, and somehow she gets through this crowd and just in faith just touches him, saying, maybe if I just touch the guy. I heard he's the son of God. I heard he's the, gonna, the, the coming king. I heard he's everything. I don't, maybe it's real, and I'm just going to, in faith, step out and do it. And he touches him. And Jesus realized something happened, and he meets this woman, and he says, you're healed. You're healed. Then he keeps going. He doesn't stop and have a party. He doesn't say, hey, let's just heal everyone here. Like, come on, everyone line up. I know you got a lot, there's a lot of problems around here, a lot of needs. No, one woman heals her in that moment and then keeps going. In fact, if you read the rest of the story, he makes it to Jairus' house eventually that day and heals his daughter as well. Tons of needs, tons of problems, tons of issues. And God's heart through Jesus is for hurting, poor, needy people. And he heals one. Too many needs, too little time. And he heals one. Jesus models for us what we do with this dilemma. How do we reconcile this call in our lives as followers of Jesus to serve those in need outside these walls with the fact that there's too much, too much need and we have too little time? Well, it's this. When it comes to serving the poor and needy, you do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. It's as simple as that. You do for one what you wish, what you dream, what you, what you just burns your heart to do for everyone. Because there is too much need and there is too little time. But Jesus knew every life mattered. And Jesus knew that when you do nothing, no one gets helped. And if you let the overwhelming sense of the need being too great and the, uh, the, the nagging sense every day that I just don't have any time guide your decision on this and allow you to do nothing, then we've missed it. We've missed it. And I think there's two reasons why it's so important to live out this principle. Why today I'm going to challenge you not just to take that step of serving others around you in the church, but to do something in the community, do something outside these church walls to make a difference in someone's life who's needy, who's hurting, who's poor. The first one is this. You never know what long-term, long-term impact, excuse me, one act of service may have. You just don't. You can't see right now by me taking a step of faith by me reaching out, maybe just the smallest of thing and the littlest of time, but me just doing something, you don't know what impact that might make for the future. I came across this, I don't know if any of you guys have seen this, but I came across this video, it seems like it's going viral now on the internet, um, with this professor showing the, um, the impact of a chain of dominoes and what it can do. Again, maybe some of you have seen it, but take a quick look. Now, for you dudes, I know the application you want to put into practice, right? I'm going to go get me some dominoes and get some big ones. We're going to see if this really works. Fine. That's great, too. But it's a beautiful illustration, as silly as it may sound, of when you and I choose to just do something. The needs are too, I know, they're too many. It's, it's too overwhelming for us as any one individual, any one church. 
You know, there's too little time. But you can do something. You can do something. And you never know, you never know what long-term impact it may make on someone's life. You may never know this side of heaven. I've come to a place in my life where I realized, you know what, if I never know during my time here on earth what my obedience to God meant, what my act of service meant to someone, if I, I gotta be okay with that. Because that's God's deal. He just tells you and I, obey, do what I've asked you to do. I'm the one who ultimately changes lives. I'm the ult ultimately the one who uses what you have to offer to change people. There's a ministry that we partner with, um, and I, maybe I should not be super declarative about this. I don't want to put God in a box, but I'm sure we will pretty much always partner with this ministry because we love what they do, what they stand for, and how they live out this principle uh, in our local community, and it's Young Life. Uh, Young Life is a great organization that um, really takes this idea of, you know what, as adults, we have something to give. I know we're all crazy busy, and I know the need is huge, but we can give a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, a little bit of money, whatever, to help kids know there's hope for their lives. To know kids that there's a God who loves them and sent their son, his son Jesus to die for them. And I'm going to ask Michelle Carnes, who's the area director for Snoqualmie Valley Young Life, who also happens to be part of this church and a good friend of mine, uh, to come up and tell us a little bit about Young Life, because you guys you know this is a ministry, specifically Snoqualmie Valley Young Life, that we support financially on a monthly basis. Um, but I also want to start getting more of us involved with Young Life. Some of you have some time that you could give to hang out with kids and love on them. Um, so Michelle, tell us what Young Life is, in case some of us don't really know what the ministry is. And then um, we'd love to hear an, an example of maybe a kid in Young Life right now that you're working with that you know, just these little acts of service towards this child, just loving on them is making a long-term impact. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Dave. Oh, and you can watch some pictures above as well. Yeah. <laughs> some wild stuff going back there. So Young Life, uh, really simply put, is uh, adult, uh, mature followers of Christ, leaders, uh, spending time with middle and high school kids, uh, going where they're at at high school, football games, uh, middle school games, uh, at the school. We spend a lot of time at the school, which is awesome that we have the opportunity to be able to do that. Dances too, right? Oh yeah, chaperone dances, Straight. everything. Always where the kids are at, <laughs> yeah, get our groom on. <laughs> so yeah, I, it's amazing uh, as you develop these relationships with these kids and uh, I'm very passionate about this um, because I was saved through Young Life and Therefore, uh, I love developing these relationships with the kids uh, and, by, and have the opportunity to, to be heard, to invite them to club, which is large um, gathering. You might have seen some pictures up there. Uh, maybe invite them to camp. Uh, we have these amazing summer camps that we bring kids to. Um, or even small group, campaigners, uh, Bible study, where we go a little bit deeper um, into the Word, which has been amazing. And uh, one story in particular, uh, is a gal, we'll call her Jessica, right? <laughs> uh, I met um, at the school, and uh, she was a little confused about why I was there. You know, don't you have your own friends? <laughs> no, I, I'm really just wanting to hang out with you. And after I got to know Jessica, I earned that right to be able to invite her to a club where we call it Party with a Purpose. Um, it's wild, crazy games. Um, it's all set up with the kids in mind. In the end, uh, we share the gospel with the kids. And it spoke to Jessica. She uh, was into what she was hearing and liked what she heard. And uh, she had the opportunity to go to camp where she ultimately gave her life to Christ. And I was there. It was amazing. And uh, she has a sense uh, been super involved since then. She's been coming to club, but kind of like that domino effect. Like she's inviting tons more kids to club and to camp and uh, adore her. And she's in a Bible study now with me and her family's still on the journey. Uh, we're praying for actually for her family, but uh, she's there, which is amazing. And I get a front row seat. It's all that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing. Um, you guys, I'm going to tell you in just a minute how you can get involved in Young Life uh, if you would like to, but really, again, it's just another example of living this out, right? And we're, guys, just so you know, we're not trying to recreate the wheel here at I-90 when it comes to community outreach and doing stuff to meet the needs of the poor and the needy and uh, broken kids and broken families, all that kind of, there's great stuff happening. We just as a church want to come alongside those who are already doing it and saying, you know what, we, we, want, to, we want to help you out. We want to partner with you. And so we've got a few um, specific 
organizations that we do that with, and I'll share that in just a moment. But there's one last reason real quick um, that I want to let you know about in terms of why it's so important to live out this principle as followers of Jesus. Again, if you want to be serious about knowing him, if you want to be serious about becoming like him, which is really the definition of being a Christian, it's not knowing a handful of Bible verses or checking a box or this or that. Jesus defined it himself. You want to, you want to know me? Then be like me. Follow me. Live as I live. Love as I love. That's really what it means to be a Christian. Um, there's one more reason why living that out is so important. See, when you touch the lives of the poor and the needy, you need to know it's not just the lives of the poor and needy you are touching. Jesus was real clear on this. In fact, he told a parable one time where he, um, he was talking about the end times and his, helping his followers kind of understand, well, when will all this come to an end and how will that work? And Jesus, there's certain people who have their faith in God and certain people that don't. And, and you know, help us, help us understand all that. So Jesus told some parables to kind of help them figure out well, what's it all going to look like and whatnot. And one particular that he told, and I won't go into all the big theological ramifications of it. You can look it up yourself in Matthew 25 if you want. But he was basically saying to his disciples, you know what, if you really know me, you really follow me, you're going to have a heart like mine. You're going to love people like I love them. You're going to meet the needs of people like I came to meet the needs of people. And so he says at the end of his parable, the king will reply referring to himself, to all his, uh, to these people who are saying, well, um, you're saying some of us knew you because we did all these things, Jesus, because we served the poor and because we helped the sick and because we uh, fed the hungry and all these things. And well, I don't get it. What's the connection? And Jesus ends his parable with this statement. The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. There's something, and I don't know how it works, but there's something that takes place when we serve those in need. Again, outside of the family, right? We, we take it upon ourselves to bring a message of hope and love and grace and goodness beyond our church walls, especially to those who are hurting the most around us. Jesus says, it wasn't just those people that you touched, it was me. You touched me. You got closer to me than maybe you could otherwise because my heart's for the poor and needy. I mean, that's where I am. And again, it plays out in all kinds of different ways in all sorts of contexts, so it doesn't always have to look the same. But the point is this. You want to be close to me? You want to be close to my heart? Go where I go. Yeah, there's a lot of needs. And if you just think in terms of the needs, you'll be overwhelmed, you'll end up not doing anything. Yeah, you don't have much time. Guess what? I was busier than you were. But I get it. You, you don't have a lot of time. So, do what I did. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And every time you do that one thing, you can know this could have a long-term impact that could literally change someone's life. Maybe change a whole lot of people's lives, as Michelle just described with this girl in Young Life. And, and, I'm not just touching the poor and the needy when I do this. I'm touching Jesus himself. Jesus, um, it's so good to know you. And to know what you've done for us. And I pray, Father, that um, every person at I-90 would fall in love with you. Jesus, you are life. You are hope. You are everything. And we desperately need you in our lives. Uh, Father, I pray more and more that as a church, um, you would kind of push me out of the way. You'd push us as a church out of the way. And that people would just walk in here and see you. Um, and God, I know that when we put our faith in you and we say, Jesus, I want to follow you, God, you... Um, you love us too much to just let us sit and soak. You want us to get out there. You want us to make a difference. So, Father, help us to really take this to heart. God, help us to be okay with the fact that we can't meet all the needs and that we are really busy, but that we can still do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. Jesus, I'm so glad you modeled that for us. I'm so glad that as God in the flesh, we could see you and your humanity live this stuff out. And that through the power of your spirit inside of us, God, we can follow your lead. We can be like you. So Jesus, help us to do it. Help us to be a church that is always, first and foremost, looking to bless others, be servants to others, to truly be like you. I pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Guys, thanks for being here. We'll see you next Sunday.